you are watching Redicon. What are spectrum of the rotator cuff disease? Spectrum of rotator cuff disease could be starting from tendinopathy, partial tearing, full thickness tear, complete tear, and massive tear. And we're going to uh, go through the whole spectrum, usually seen in patient above 40 and does not necessarily correlate with the patient pain. How we are going to uh, see it in the imaging, usually there is abnormal increased signal within the substance of the tendon with no extension to either articular or basal surface. So, and usually it has intermediate signal, it's not a fluid signal. And sometimes we see only swelling or increase in the thickness of the tendon, it's enough to call it tendinopathy. So either abnormal internal signal intensity or abnormal morphology or configuration of the tendon. As you see here, if you look to the supraspinatus tendon, looks swollen and thickened, and there is internal intermediate signal intensity. We always like to see the tendon as a dark signal, particularly in the sequences with high TE, and this is where we're going to be confident in making diagnosis either of tear or tendinopathy looking to the sequence either proton density or T2 with relative high TE. Uh, this is because uh, with the low TE, we know we might have a magic angle artifact, particularly with uh, tendon change the direction. So let's go through spectrum of rotator cuff tear. It could be incomplete, and incomplete could be partial thickness, only part of the thickness of the tendon, and this could be bursal, intrasubstance, or articular surface. Could be full thickness tear, could be full thickness tear, meaning that the tear does extend from one surface to another, but it does not mean the whole tendon is torn. Complete, that means the whole tendon is torn and usually it is uh, retracted. It is full thickness and full width of the tendon, and I'm going to discuss this in more details. And massive rotator cuff when we have more than two tendons are torn. So if we look to the tendon here, normal tendon, this is what we call the bursal surface of the tendon, and this is the articular surface of the tendon. If we get a fluid signal along the articular surface, does not extend all the way, we call it a partial thickness there because only part of the thickness is involved. So in this case, it's involving the articular surface, so we're going to call it articular surface partial thickness tear. If the tear extends from one surface to another, as you see here, from the bursal to the articular, we call it full thickness tear. As you see here, the full thickness tear does not have to involve the whole tendon because the supraspinatus probably extending from here to here. And this is why we talk about the width concept of each tendon. So there could be full thickness tear, but part of the tendon is still intact. As you see, we still call this full thickness tear. So what is complete tear? Complete tear means the whole tendon from the anterior to the posterior and from the bursal to the articular surface is torn, and this is when we see usually there is retraction of the tendon. Let's start with the spectrum, intratendinous tear. Some surgeons don't like to call it tear because that's gonna confuse the patient. There is a tear, you should treat me because I had the tear, and actually these are usually are conservative. So uh, some people call them intrasubstance cleft or fissuring, and that's fine if, if you wanna call it like this. So how we differentiate it from, how to differentiate this from the tendinopathy, it's actually when we see a fluid signal within the tendon with no extension to either surface could be linear or globular in appearance. You have to be careful. If you see this, you have to scroll very carefully in your sagittal and coronal and see if there is any image showing extension to the articular or personal surface, and usually to the articular surface, you have to look carefully. This is an example you can see here there is a fluid abnormal signal within the tendon and the articular fibers and the bursal fibers are intact. So this is an example of intrasubstance tear. Another example you can see a linear 
with the bursal and the articular fibers are intact, so we call it intrasubstance tear. Partial thickness tear, it's involved one surface, either the bursal or the articular. Articular surface is more common involved, ratio two to one. And conventional arthrogram, still very good, but it is less sensitive for the articular surface partial thickness tear. And this is where the MRI arthrogram might be more superior, particularly for the articular surface partial thickness tear. Nevertheless, uh, in our practice for most of the rotator cuff disease, we do only conventional arthrogram. Uh, at the beginning of, sorry, conventional uh, shoulder uh, MRI, and some institute, uh, they might consider uh, uh, arthrogram for articular surface partial thickness tear. As you see here, you can see a fluid signal intensity involving the articular surface of the distal supraspinatus tendon. The bursal surface is still intact, so this is an example of partial thickness tear at the supraspinatus. This is a, a, a case of arthrogram. You can see here that some of the contrast actually extending through the substance of the tendon that does indicate there is articular surface partial thickness tear, and that's give the axis for contrast to go in. Another example, you can see here how the arthrogram can be more superior in showing you the articular surface partial thickness tear, but usually it is low grade. Full thickness tear, as we said earlier, it could be part of the tendon only showing the full thickness tear or the whole tendon is actually torn. And here the accuracy of the conventional shoulder MRI is very high and it's as good as the arthrogram. Example, you can see here there is a fluid signal intensity with complete discontinuity of the tendon, uh, the extending from the bursal to the articular surface. In the sagittal, same thing, but the posterior part of the tendon is still intact. So whenever you see a tendinal tear, you have to look at, at both coronal and sagittal, very essential. Assessment of the tear, if you get the tear, you have to give the size of the tear in both coronal and sagittal, so give the transfers and the anterior posterior dimension of the tear. See if there is any tendinal retraction, particularly if there is, if it's uh, complete, as you see here, the patient had a tear with retraction, give the degree of retraction, how much is retracted from the uh, insertion, and actually there are grades for these, I don't wanna, it's, I don't have enough time to go through them, Muscle volume, uh, it's another uh, predictor. For all these uh, factors that I mentioned about the measurement, retraction, and muscle volume are very prognostic factor for the outcome of surgery. So it's very important to be in our report, but that, that's gonna uh, help the surgeon to decide how much uh, outcome he's going to get out of the surgery. If the patient have large tear, severe retraction, and severe atrophy, the outcome of the surgery is low, so probably he will not consider surgery. So that's a, just an example. So how to adjust uh, 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 to do the muscle volume? Again, there is a grading system for the muscle volume, but generally, if you take the sagittal and take a, a line between the acromion and the crocoid, the muscle belly should be above this. If you look here, Carefully, if you draw the line, the muscle belly definitely is, is low, low, and you can see there is a fatty infiltration. One of the important things sometimes I see in the reports coming from outside, sometimes it's very hard, we know in radiology, it's very hard sometimes to make a diagnosis for something that's absent, actually. So you have to be careful. If you see the humeral head touching the acromion, you know whatever in between is completely gone. So the supraspinatus is completely torn. So it just uh, because I've seen some people calling mild tendinopathy because they don't see the tendon, uh, so they cannot say uh, there is a tear. So you don't have to see a tear here because it is very extensive tear and the tendon actually is completely absent and the humeral head is migrating superiorly abutting the acromion. One of the things that we could see with the chronic massive rotator cuff, something called the geyser cyst, 
this is usually a cyst seen dorsal or superior to the acromioclavicular joint and usually associated with a chronic rotator cuff tear. And the idea here, uh, usually the fluid, uh, it is extending from the joint or from the bursa through the acromioclavicular joint and get uh, trapped uh, more superiorly. Usually it is a thick gelatinous material similar to the ganglion cyst. The importance of this, it is uh, because some uh, most of the time patients present as a soft tissue mass. So if you see the location and if you look at the X-ray or MRI and see there is complete rotator cuff, you know this is a geyser cyst related to the chronic rotator cuff disease. I'm not going to go deep on this, but there are special terminology used for the insertional part of the tear. We know most of the tear happening probably 1 to 1.5 centimeter from the insertion, but the, there are some tears happening at the footprint or at the insertional, and this has been given a name. Pasta, which is the partial articular surface tear at the insertion. Reversed pasta is the bursal surface or SID, and this is actually, if you look carefully, you see them most of the time you can see intrasubstance tear with cystic formation at the insertion, uh, full thickness tear at the insertion. This is an example of insertional or rim rent. Some people try to, uh, like to call them rim rent or insertional or footprint tear. You can see here high grade bursal surface partial thickness tear and the articular fiber actually are still intact here. This is a reverse basta. And here a case of, uh, actually, uh, we didn't talk about the subscapularis too much, but here, one after we finish the infra, supraspinatus, and teres minor, we move to the subscapularis tendon. And you can see here, in this case, there is actually full thickness, complete tear of subscapularis tendon. and full thickness tear of supraspinatus as well as say through the same patient. So this is when we call it a massive or major rotator cuff tear. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the notification bell for new courses. For more modules and radiology CMAs, please visit www.radicon.org.